Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak at Big Data Spain, and thank you for staying so late in the day to hear this talk. So I'm going to talk about using in-memory models of real-world systems for operational intelligence, which is not the title in your program, but it's similar. So, uh, so first of all, well, let's talk about what is operational intelligence. We're very excited about that because we think this trend towards real-time analytics providing intelligence for live systems will be catching on uh, very quickly over the next few years. So I'll give you an example of tracking cable uh, viewers and helping a cable company to provide upsell offers to maintain its competitive position with the onslaught of new over-the-top media. Also, we'll talk about how operational intelligence is implemented with in-memory computing. In particular, our company develops what are called in-memory data grids. We'll talk about how in-memory data grids store data across a cluster of commodity servers, how they integrate data parallel analytics into this to provide operational intelligence, and then how you can view this platform as a platform for implementing an in-memory model of the live system and how that differs from other approaches such as Spark and Storm. I'll give you some, model, some examples of using in-memory models to provide operational intelligence in other verticals besides set-top boxes, and then we'll directly look at Spark and Storm and how they're different. And then finally, I'll dive into one example in financial services for implementing operational intelligence and show you a little bit of Java code. Just don't ask too many hard questions at the end. And then uh, we'll take a look at how we've implemented Hadoop Map Reduces a layer on top of our APIs and how that can allow you to do all of this with pure Map Reduce APIs uh, in order to leverage skill sets that already exist. So I'm Bill Bain. I'm the founder and CEO of Scaleout Software. I have a a long history in parallel computing, going back to Bell Laboratories, when it was called Bell Laboratories, and later Intel Supercomputer Systems, and then more recently at Microsoft. So our company develops in-memory data grids, which is software. It's not hardware, it's software middleware. And this software is designed to do two things. One is to scale the performance of applications by storing business logic state or data in memory across a cluster of servers so that you can scale the storage capacity and the throughput of your applications in memory state and make it globally accessible across threads running in multiple servers. And also it provides operational intelligence by integrating data parallel analytics into the grid and we'll see some of the benefits of doing that. And so we've been in business about nine years and have about 400 customers running on about 10,000 servers, and that's all I'll say about our company for this talk. So, what is operational intelligence? Operational intelligence allows online systems, that is live systems that are used operationally in mission-critical applications, to be able to analyze the data they're generating as they're updating the state of their system, and then to be able to provide feedback within milliseconds to seconds so that you can steer the behavior of the system, typically to improve competitive positioning, but also to enhance the customer experience. So for example, in e-commerce, operational intelligence can be used to construct personalized recommendations and feed those recommendations back to the shoppers, whether they're web shoppers or uh, brick and mortar store shoppers. And I, I will say we're working with a partner here, Quality Objects, they're here, here in Madrid, and they're actually developing the application software for doing operational intelligence and providing personalized recommendations to shoppers. So th we're starting to see the use of operational intelligence with in-memory computing as the underlying platform be developed and uh, deployed. Now, other examples include equity trading systems, and we'll see an example of a hedge fund in a little while. Of course, airline reservation systems where you're tracking flyers and when weather conditions or other problems emerge, be able to detect the affected flyers, be able to reroute, reroute them or otherwise take care of problems as they come up in real time. Of course, credit card and wire transfer is looking for potential fraud as quickly as you can so you can stop fraud uh, immediately and not detect it later. And of course, the Internet of Things, for example, smart grids, uh, tuning power. We were talking uh, to a company that does wind turbines, and you can use operational intelligence to help tune a wind farm to optimize its power generation. So here's an example. Uh, we're, we've been talking with a cable company in uh, the Atlanta area on the US, and what they need to be able to do is to provide personalized offers 
to their customers, and they want to be able to do that for a population of 10 million set-top boxes, which are generating channel change events at the rate of 2.2 billion events per day, or about 25,000 per second. They want to be able to correlate and enrich those events so they can determine what people are watching and what behaviors they're ob observing across uh, the, the population of viewers, and then be able to tune offers, feed them to their proprietary recommendation engine, and send them out in real time. So they can, for example, if you're watching a sports show, uh, they might upsell you on their sports package, as an example. So what the, the, the key here is to introspect on what your viewers' preferences are, what their history of TV watching is, what others in their area are watching, and what their history of shows that they've watched looks like, and then in real time, take all that information and generate your best recommendation. So they need to be able to do this in under five seconds, and they have been taking about six hours to correlate what they call cleanse this information because they have to remove events such as channel switching and uh, there's the other case of the viewer that falls asleep and doesn't turn off his or her TV, they want to purge that and then be able to match that to the programming and then feed that back as I mentioned. So this is the result of an experiment we did for them. We did a proof of concept and showed them a OI platform implemented as a dashboard which you see on the right up here. And this dashboard shows our, uh, that we're, we're simulating a population of 10 million viewers in the San Diego area. We actually took live programming information from San Diego, which is available on the web, and fed it into this simulator. We ran this on about 10 servers in Amazon EC2, and we're able to, within uh, one second, do the correlation, the cleansing, and the enrichment of the data to feed that to their recommendation engine, which was quite a jump from six hours down to one second. And we're also able to sustain, as you see in the dashboard, about 30,000 events per second, which is well in excess of the requirement, in addition to a gathering aggregate statistics, such as the number of viewers uh, watching a given show, uh, also the top 10 shows by zip code, as you see in the bottom right there. So this is an example of real-time operational intelligence and how it can benefit a company that is trying to steer the behavior of a live system. Now, let's take a look at how operational intelligence fits with business intelligence, or so-called big data. Well, as you see on the right, most uses of big data are with static data sets, and they're looking for long-term trends. They may take minutes to hours to examine petabytes of information. The net result is they can run this in batch. They don't have to worry about startup times and that sort of thing, those kinds of overheads, because they're not trying to generate results in milliseconds to seconds. Whereas on the left, you see operational intelligence. With operational intelligence, you're tracking live data that's percolating all the time, and you need to be able to examine it within milliseconds to seconds, sometimes minutes, and provide immediate feedback to a live system. You also have to be able to run not in a data warehouse, but in a live mission-critical environment. And we'll see that some of the requirements on the left give rise to a different implementation than you might traditionally see coming from the big data community. And that's why in-memory data grids are particularly suitable for operational intelligence. However, one of the things we learned in talking to a very large food company in the U.S. that has point of sale in many cities in the U.S. as well as web presence um, doing pizzas, of all things, that, uh, that you can integrate operational intelligence with business intelligence seamlessly into one overall system. Now, this particular company is deploying Hadoop MapReduce with one of the, the big vendors uh, in their data warehouse, rolling out their old, uh, their old hardware and software, replacing it with a Hadoop cluster. And then they, the problem they have is they're feeding streams of data in from their point of sale stores and restaurants, and they have to ETL that data to translate it to store it in HDFS. And that's a role that can be performed by an in-memory computing system providing uh, operational intelligence, as well as having that same function provide tactical feedback directly to the store. For example, you can determine which uh, servers or are being more efficient than others and report that immediately to a manager. You can detect when uh, food supplies are running low at a particular restaurant, while back in the data warehouse, you could be looking at which products are selling best and which offers should be promoted over the next week or month. So the two of the big challenges that we seek to address with operational intelligence are number one, is how do you reliably process updates 
that are coming from a live system, how do you manage them, how do you store them, and how do you then analyze them so in real time so that you can provide this live feedback. And these are big challenges because you have a high event rate and you also have to do parallel analysis uh, very, very quickly so that you can provide this feedback. So the architecture that we have been working on for more than a decade, which we find is very suitable for this task, is called in-memory data grid. And an in-memory data grid is simply out-of-process in-memory storage that's hosted on a cluster of commodity servers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So an in-memory data grid is hosting data that's uh, part of the business logic state of an application. And we'll talk about how the, the thesis of this talk, if you will, is how what you want to store in the grid is not the events per se, but a model of the real world system that you're tracking and providing feedback for. Because by managing the state of the system directly, then you provide a natural place to host the events that flow in and to correlate them and then to analyze them in parallel. And this is a different way to look at the event stream than you might find with technologies like Storm. And it's a different way to view the data in memory than you would find with a technology like Spark. And we'll see in a couple of slides what exactly the difference is. Now, this data that's hosted in memory represents active entities in the system, in the real world system, and that can be enriched then from a secondary storage. We just heard a talk on MongoDB or ToroDB, and, but MongoDB, those kinds of architectures that, are scale, that scale out, provide scalable throughput and data storage, can be used to hold a very large population of entities, some of which, most of which are inactive. And then when an active entity enters the system through an event, then the history of that entity and the preferences, say for a shopper, can be brought into memory and so you have a very rich set of state in memory for the active entities. And then in parallel, you can analyze that, look for the patterns and trends that are necessary, and provide feedback or alerts to the real world system. So you see this is all centered around in memory computing that is uh, the centerpiece for hosting a model of the real world system. So in-memory data grids have been around for more than a decade. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of technologies such as InfiniSpan from Red Hat, uh, Oracle Coherence, formerly TangoSol Coherence, uh, Gemfire, which is now part of Pivotal, uh, Gigaspaces, and uh, Microsoft had a technology called AppFabric. Um, they're uh, moving more towards Redis. And then we have a technology that we have developed also for the same purpose. That's to set the stage on the type of software this is. So it's hosting data that's integrated with an application. People often confuse this as a data storage repository, but it's not designed for persistent data storage as a database or a MongoDB would be. It's designed to host data in memory with high availability that can be accessed directly by an application, which is typically writ written in an object-oriented language such as Java or C Sharp or C++. Hence, the storage model for an in-memory data grid is object-oriented, and typically data is represented as serialized blobs of objects, such as plain old Java objects, that are identified with keys. So sometimes this is called a key value store. Now the physical implementation is a set of servers hosting a service processor daemon on each server, and the objects are then stored out of process across those servers and load balanced uh, transparently across those servers. That gives you the ability to have scalable storage capacity simply by adding servers, and also you have scalable throughput, which means as the workload increases, the throughput increases so that the access times remain fixed. And I should have said that the typical access model, as we saw in the previous talk, is uh, create, read, update, and delete of key value pairs, the so-called CRUD APIs. Also, in-memory data grids sometimes can be queried by the properties, such as the Java properties of their objects, and a set of keys can be returned that match those properties. And I'll show you an example of that in a little while. So also an in-memory data grid is providing high availability, typically through data replication. Not rep replicating data to all servers, but replicating to a constant number, typically one or two. And that way, the scalability is not impaired to provide high availability. That's, people often confuse that. Now, high availability through data replication was a choice that was made because in-memory data grids are designed to fit into live mission-critical environments. And you'll see how that design choice is different from the design choice of Spark in just a minute. So in-memory data grids use an object-oriented view of data, and they typically store 
a collection as a group of objects or a namespace, we'll see the name cache used in the code example, a namespace of objects which represent serialized instances of a given type. So a given type, many instances are stored in one namespace and you can have multiple namespaces in the in-memory data grid. And objects are independently and individually accessible with ACID-like properties, except for the, for the durable part, because depending on your assumption about durability, in-memory data stores are not durable if you lose power for an entire data center, unless you have a replication mechanism to a remote site or you're backing up live. So we won't go into that in this talk, but suffice it to say, there's atomic updating and independent updating of objects in the grid. And this is also a design choice which is different than Spark, and we'll see that in a minute. Now, in-memory data grids have accrued various semantics and properties, as you see there, over the years, but most of those are not particularly interesting today, but I wanted to show you that. Now, what's really interesting and exciting about in-memory data grids, and this is something we first recognized in about 2007, although in parallel computing we have been doing this for about three decades, however, that technology from high-performance computing is, uh, I first saw it from the national labs in the U.S., such as Los Alamos um, and others, is the use of in-memory computing to, do, to implement data parallel computation. And the technique that's used there, we have embodied in our product, we use a, uh, the acronym Parallel Method Invocation, or PMI. And that means we're running user-defined methods, say in Java or C-sharp, across a collection of objects. And these methods are defined on, an, on a type. So if you have customers, you might have a method for a customer type, and that would be run in parallel across all of the objects that have been selected by a query within the in-memory data grid. Now the key observation here is that by integrating data, data parallel computation with in-memory data storage, you avoid data motion. And when you avoid data motion, you can achieve very scalable throughput. It's data motion that kills you, and in fact, it's data motion that is really the basis behind the genesis of Spark, because Spark moves data into memory and keeps it in memory for multiple data parallel operators, and that's how you can achieve speed up. So anytime you can avoid data motion, you're gonna get much better performance, as you can see here. This is an experiment we did. This was run several years ago in the Microsoft lab um, in Redmond, and it shows a comparison of doing PMI, parallel method invocation, on a workload, a financial services workload, and also running independently, uh, that's the red line, and then the blue line represents running the same application but randomly accessing data from the grid. Hence, most of the data is coming from a remote server and going across the network. And what we've observed over the last 30 years, it's been a very interesting uh, set of uh, rebalancing between CPU and memory and network speed, and right now network speed is uh, really the bottleneck because we have multi-core CPUs and very fast, large memory, but uh, we still are running with gigabit networks in most places unless you have InfiniBand. And uh, most of our commercial customers don't have InfiniBand. So the net result is that if you move data across the network, you kill scalability. And by the way, this line here, the red line showing linear scalability, is, re represents a mathematical view of how to implement scalability in a scaled out architecture. Namely, you increase the workload across the x-axis as you increase the number of servers to support that workload so that the time to perform any given piece of work in that workload remains constant and doesn't grow. And by if you can achieve that without bottlenecks, you'll have linear scalability. And if you're interested in that, I refer you to uh, the work of John Gustafson, who first observed this and documented this in the CACM many years ago. Now, we can then use this platform to implement an in-memory model of live entities. These could be shopping carts, uh, they could be portfolios, we'll see an example coming right up about financial portfolios for a hedge fund. They could be inventory, they could be set-top boxes. In particular, we store these entities in memory and we enrich them from, as we just uh, looked at before, secondary storage and then analyze them in parallel using this data parallel anal analysis technique and then we pr can provide feedback to that live system. Again, the key observation is that we're modeling these live entities and that gives us a natural way to correlate and enrich, uh, the correlate the incoming events and enrich them from secondary storage because the entities themselves are the organizing basis. And that may sound very obvious, but I'll give you an example in a minute where it wasn't obvious. Um, so first of all, you could see now how we can apply the 
this model to the set-top box example we saw in the beginning because we model in memory the set-top boxes. And now we have a basis for enriching that for, uh, to get the viewer preferences from secondary storage. And notice correlation becomes almost trivial because we simply apply updates to a given viewer's uh, set-top box object as those channel switches come in, instead of having to correlate that offline as the cable company is currently doing. And then also we can cleanse that at the time we're updating, we can run a data parallel operation to cleanse and enrich all of the objects and then feed them to the recommendation engine the interesting ones. Now here's an example of a real customer uh, we have in Southern California that deals with perishable goods. And the challenge they had was how do they reconcile inventory with orders? And the problem is if orders come in for perishable goods and the inventory actually won't be there at the right instant in time, then they have to give a credit back to the customer because they couldn't fill the order. And the problem that they faced was that their ordering system and their inventory system were siloed in two databases. So the approach they took with an in-memory data grid was to store the orders in one namespace and the inventory in a different namespace and then have a set of servers uh, outside of the grid which would simply do parallel queries for orders by SKU and inventory by SKU and then run their reconciliation algorithm on that. They have a very proprietary algorithm for reconciling and the problem was that was taking them hours. Uh, the original system with the silo databases was taking once a day. They could only do it once a day because they had to run it at 2 in the morning. But they went down to two hours, but they were absolutely saturating the network. And you can see that that kind of computing where you're doing parallel queries and pulling data out of the grid in induces a large amount of data motion, and that kills scalable throughput. So we suggest that they reorganize the data by SKU. And by doing so, as orders come in, they update the SKU object, and as inventory comes in, it, uh, inventory changes, it updates the SKU object, and now they can do a data parallel computation based on the SKUs and avoid all data motion except for the merging of the final results. And the result was it went down to under two minutes just instantly by doing that because the data motion was removed. So the key is to have the right in-memory model of the live system. In this case, it's the SKUs. And if you think from a database point of view, what we're really doing is pre-joining, so you don't do joins. Um, you know, if this were a database system, you would do the joins uh, as you needed to perform the reconciliation, and that induces data motion. But if you pre-join the data because you recognize you need this data joined in this way, then you can avoid all of that ne network overhead. So there are other examples. Uh, one is in web shopping where you're hosting customers, and we looked at that a little while ago. Uh, so uh, what I'm pointing out in this sequence of slides is what is the in-memory model of the live system? So for web shopping or for brick and mortar shopping, we'll see in the next slide, the model is the customers themselves, which are enriched from secondary storage, which can be analyzed in parallel and the feedback generated uh, to the shopping site, whether it's the web or on-premise. And of course, we're seeing interest in this and we're talking with a company in Portugal that's very interested in tracking inventory by RFID and matching that to shoppers who are on, on, um, in the store and have opted in to be tracked. And this enables the operational intelligence system to provide alerts to salespeople so they can tell the salesperson, uh, go get this inventory from the stock room because this customer likes this brand and his or her size is not out on the rack, and that's just one example. You can also look at where the inventory flows, and if the inventory is left in the changing room, uh, then you actually have a basis for going back to the manufacturer and saying, your product is not selling, you know, this is, maybe you should give us a better price break. So there are many opportunities for operational intelligence when you can track a live dynamic system, and this is a platform we feel works very well to do that. Now just briefly, comparing in-memory data grids to Spark. So we saw two, two ways in which they're different. The, the reason for this is the genesis and the focus of Spark was to accelerate uh, uh, big data, data, uh, data parallel computing for business intelligence, not operational intelligence. So it makes an appropriate set of trade-offs, namely the use of in-memory computing, to do that. It moves data in from HDFS and stores it as RDDs, resilient distributed data sets, which are immutable. And that's fine because you're applying a set of data parallel operators on that data and then you're pushing the RDDs back out. Also with Spark streaming, you're breaking up the incoming stream or building an output stream as a set of RDDs which form the stream. Now the problem is if you want to model a real world system, you don't have this ability to create a collection of individually accessible objects using CRUD APIs. Also, 
because it has data parallel operations, it's really not designed for uh, use in a live system where you need CRUD. And lastly, it lacks high availability. So that they chose a different model because it's more appropriate for uh, data, a data warehouse than for an operational environment, namely the use of lineage. So if you lose a server, that data can be reconstructed by going to a checkpoint of the RDDs and, move, and playing that forward until you reconstruct the data. But you can imagine in a live operational environment, you need instant access to data after a server fails, and that can be achieved by keeping replicas and then self-healing the grid by reconstructing the quorum of replicas on the fly after a server fails. That's something that in-memory data grids typically do. And so you can see that uh, operational intelligence is better implemented with the technology of an in-memory data grid than with, with Spark for those two reasons. Now comparing to Storm, you know, Storm's focus is on continuously processing events or input streams. And that's its real strength because it's continuously running. It doesn't run as a continuous sequence of MapReduce operations, for example, but it's simply taking the data, flowing it through what are called bolts, which implement tasks, and, and then the data output flows from the bolts, uh, from a uh, hierarchy of bolts, a precedence graph, as you can see in this example here. So there are a couple of issues there. One is that it's more complex to implement a global model or a, a model of a real world system, the set of entities, because what you're really modeling here is a set of processing elements for input streams and then correlating those input streams by passing data between bolts. What you're not doing is representing a model of a live system. It, it can be done, but it's more cumbersome. The second part is that it's not minimizing data motion. In fact, there's inherent data motion between the bolts and the developer has to be aware of that to tune the overall performance of the system. And lastly, in my experience with parallel computing, I found it rather complicated to work with task precedence graphs. Task parallel computing is more difficult to develop, to understand and to tune than data parallel, which simply has uh, methods which are executed in parallel. And I'll show you an example right now. So here's an example in financial services of a hedge fund. And this hedge fund has a set of strategies. And I'm going to use the term portfolio and strategy interchangeably here because a hedging strategy has a portfolio of equities. And these equities have long positions and hedged short positions uh, so that they can implement their strategy. It also has a set of rules and parameters associated with each strategy. Now, a strategy represents a market sector like real estate or high tech or um, energy. And so the goal here is as the market prices change during the day, we get a market feed. And when the market feed comes in, we have to update the positions in each of the portfolios. And then we have to check to see whether the portfolio is out of balance. And then we have to alert a trader or cause an automated trade to rebalance the set of portfolios. Now, it was taking them 15 minutes to do this using a relational database. And of course, you know, in 15 minutes, the market can change quite a bit. So they needed a better way to do this. So the way you can do this is to use an in-memory data grid and host these hedging strategies as, as portfolio objects in the grid. So again, you have a collection of entities which represents the real world system in the sense the hedging strategies in their live system. And then you can apply market updates as snapshots. Now this is not uh, germane to the model, but the way we did this was to take the market stream and break up every second, break up the, the deltas of the change in the market prices from the previous second and package that up as a parameter object and multicast that out as a parameter to a data parallel operation. By doing that, we could update the strategies in parallel and in parallel check for divergence from their parameters and from their rules to alert the trader. And the last part is to merge the results and combine them so that we could feed a set of results out to the traders to perform the trades. We were able to get this done in 300 milliseconds. And by the way, we ran this, uh, we implemented this both with our PMI um, APIs and also with standard Hadoop MapReduce, which we enhanced to do parameter passing to mappers and global combining. And we were and comparing this to standard Apache MapReduce, that took about 15 seconds or more and uh, as I say, about 300 milliseconds. So we're getting a nice about 40x speed up in our actual measurements there. So here's the sequence of steps and the code that implements it. And you'll see it's, it's remarkably simple. The first step is to do a parallel query to specify the interesting strategies to which we want to apply the market feed. 
And those queried objects are passed locally on each server in the cluster of the in-memory data grid to a local execution engine to be analyzed and updated in parallel. And so this is what the code might look like to do that. This might seem a little daunting, but uh, it's really quite simple. Even I can understand it. Um, so um, the class here is called a portfolio class, and it has a set of properties, for the identifier for the portfolio, and then the set of long positions and the set of short positions, as well as the total value, and just for illustration purposes, the region in which this strategy is to be applied, and then a Boolean saying whether the strategy is alerted because of a divergence from the parameters. Now, in a real strategy, and interestingly, the hedge fund wouldn't tell us all of its rules and how exactly it evaluates strategies because that's highly proprietary, but it can be embodied in properties of this class. And so uh, what, what you see here at the bottom is a parallel query, based a, a parallel query on the namespace of these portfolios. So you're going to have a set of thousands of portfolio objects in the grid uh, that are named with this name portfolios. And then the in-memory object, which is representing that collection, we just call PSET or PSET here. And so we can apply a query operator to PSET and then a set of query parameters. This is sh showing a Java approach called filter methods. In C Sharp, you know, this would be done with Microsoft Link, L-I-N-Q. And this is selecting all of the portfolios that are, have a total value of greater than a million dollars that are in the US, for example. And that parallel query allows us to select a smaller a number of objects on each server that we send off to parallel analysis. So the second step is to analyze and update each object as an in-memory hydrated object. So we write a method, we call it an eval method here, which uh, takes as a parameter the market snapshot and it's a method defined on a, the portfolio class. So it takes an instance, one of the queried set of portfolio objects. And then it, you can think of this as comparable to a MapReduce mapper, except that it has an input parameter. And this was an extension we made to support this. And then it updates the positions, analyzes them, and then it optionally generates an alert by emitting its identifier as a set with one entity or no entities if it's not alerted. Now the merge method is simply a method on a set which combines two sets in, into one uh, aggregated set and so it's, it's actually absolutely trivial. So it's the final result of global combining. You can think of this as equivalent to a binary combiner in MapReduce and equivalent to having no reducer because we're going to do global combining. So you think of it as one reducer that has been implemented as a distributed combiner. And so we can, with um, global merge, combine all of the alerted strategies and feed that back to the point of call. And you'll see that in just a second. So first of all, the way if with our particular implementation, we implement the eval and the merge methods and how we specify it to the system is to have an interface called invocable. And so the user cr implements that interface by creating these two methods, eval and merge, as you see here. And you can see it's passing the types in so you know what the types are. Uh, the portfolio type and the market snapshot type, which I didn't discuss, and it emits a set. So the first, the eval method, uh, operates on a portfolio, takes in a market snapshot, it calls the underlying method for on the portfolio class uh, to uh, update and evaluate it, and then it em either emits its identifier or, uh, identifier or does not. And the merge method simply is combining them. So now this is what the, the sort of the, uh, the punchline here that's really quite interesting. With one statement of code, you can perform a complete data parallel operation. And notice that this is materially simpler than MapReduce because there's no infrastructure, there's no tuning of partitions and splits, it just works. So um, that said, as I mentioned, all of this can be implemented with pure MapReduce. And we have the code for doing this in either PMI or MapReduce, Java or C Sharp available if anybody wants to see it. So first of all, you have the namespace called PSET again, and then you apply the invoke method on it and supply parameters here. In particular, you're supplying the invocable as well as the class on which we're operating, as well as the query specification and the parameter. And notice it returns a result called alerted portfolios, which is that final merged result. Now, when, to run this, what happens is the grid takes the jars which implement this code and ship them out to the grid and spin up JVMs on every server, which uh, remain in existence, and allow then the query engine to pass the queried objects to the JVM, 
and the JVM then distributes them across the cores, so you get multi-core and then you get data parallel across the servers, multi-server uh, parallel execution. And this all just happens automatically. Um, and it's relying on the fact that the grid has already pre-distributed the portfolios statistically across the cluster of servers so that you have an even load balance. So the two things you're getting from the grid storage are the load balancing and the lack of data motion across the network. And that all just comes for free by integrating this engine into the grid. And as you add servers, you simply achieve that linear scalability that we were talking about a minute ago. Now the last part is to implement global combining. As I mentioned, you know, this technique of global aggregation goes back to high performance computing. And frankly, it was quite amazing to me when I first saw Hadoop MapReduce before I knew really what it was. I read about it and I was looking for the global combiner and I never found it. And uh, I was quite shocked because global combining is something that uh, we did quite readily in parallel computing uh, in the 90s, uh, for example, for distributed simulation to do synchronization. So the ability to have global combining is very powerful. In this case, it allows us to avoid the overhead of multiple reducers and then going out sequentially to the reduced uh, uh, output and collect that sequentially because you can use a binary combining tree and do this in logarithmic time. And that makes the merging part a very small part of the overall overhead of the data parallel operation. So the output looks something like this. We created a dashboard for this customer. And on the left, you see the strategies and the alerted ones. Uh, this every, once a second is receiving, it's sending out a market snapshot, running a data parallel operation, which takes about 300 milliseconds, receiving the alerts. It's highlighting on the left the strategies that are alerted. And then the user can click on an alerted strategy and see which positions have been alerted. So you have this ability to instantly access any strategy in the grid uh, using CRUD while you're at the same time, are you doing data parallel operations to create the alerts? This just shows you some performance results we have. This is a little bit of a bait and switch because this is not that application because I don't have a graph for this application. But it says it's this back testing application which we also ran on a grid in um, EC2 just to show you that this technology can handle a terabyte of data and deliver very fast results. In this case, it was doing stock back testing for a one terabyte data set on 75 servers, uh, and you would not need 75 servers today. This was done over a year ago uh, because we didn't have uh, 160 gigabyte servers at that time in EC2. And we're able to do that in, in 4.1 seconds when the data is being updated at the rate of 1.1 gigabytes per second. If you turn down the update rate, you'll see as you go to the blue line there and notice the linear scalability. Um, and you notice it's not perfectly linear, right? So it's, instead of your asking me afterwards, the answer is uh, there are overheads in the network, the uh, uh, noisy neighbor effects, which affect scalability when you run in the cloud. So that's what we attribute the l lack of perfect scalability to. In any case, when you reduce the update rate, the throughput goes up, and that's because the JVMs have client-side caches, which, uh, it, which have turbulence due to updates. And when you reduce the update rate, you reduce the turbulence, and more data can be accessed without crossing to the server from the JVM. Now, the last part of this talk, uh, which I have two minutes to do, is uh, to just tell you about how we can implement in-memory MapReduce uh, using this technology. And the reason for doing this is so you can leverage skill sets uh, that you might already have in MapReduce to do the exact same operational intelligence that we're talking about. And by the way, uh, this is material that, uh, that you might find interesting if you, uh, there's more than I'll have time to present, but if you're interested, I'm sure we can get you the slide deck and you can read all the details. Uh, we worked on this for over a year, and what we learned is you can pretty much eliminate the batch scheduling overhead, and you can optimize the data shuffling optionally turn off the sorting, add parameter passing, detect when you have, if you have a reducer which is the same as the combiner and it's doing binary combining, then you can automatically get the global merging, writing all this in the form of MapReduce. And then you can just run this from a workstation, and let it spin up JVMs, and you can optionally persist those JVMs across multiple MapReduces so there's not, they're not torn down and brought up every time you do a MapReduce. You can also integrate it with Yarn so that it runs completely transparently. Um, and this is the only implementation I'm aware of that runs completely transparently in Yarn uh, in memory and able to access data from HDFS as well as from the in-memory data grid. In fact, you can run Hive on top of this 
and Hive will, you can have a Hive schema for the in-memory data grid and access memory-based data. Now I'm gonna skip all this except to show you this one slide. The way you implement this is you run PMI two times. PMI runs for the mappers and it does aggressive combining, pushes the combined data to the grid, shuffles for shuffling, and then to, out to the reducers, which run as a second phase of PMI. So now you see the relationship between PMI and MapReduce. And we did numerous optimizations to make this run well, and I'm gonna skip that because I'm at 40 minutes in just a second. Uh, but suffice it to say, there are numerous in-memory optimizations you can do to accelerate this by pipelining key value pairs, by streamlining the data storage model that traditionally has been used for grids and so forth. And so let me just uh, go to the recap here. So what we've learned here is that online systems that are handling live data can really benefit from operational intelligence to steer their behavior and improve the competitive position of, the de of their deployers. And operational intelligence can be implemented in a very natural way using in-memory data grids because an in-memory data grid integrates data storage with data parallel analysis to deliver very high performance, as we saw, by eliminating data motion, by leveraging the natural load balancing of the, of the grid, and by taking advantage of the inherent high availability of the grids so that it will work well in a live system. And it allows the data to be individually updated so that we can take the event stream and automatically correlate it according to the objects that represent the real world entities. So we're leveraging the model, we're leveraging the in-memory platform, we can run optionally standard MapReduce, and the net effect is we can get results within milliseconds to seconds. So thank you very much, and let me know if you have any questions.